Secretary Searles, uh, we have some good news to announce. As you know, after Irene ravaged Vermont, destroyed over 500 miles of roads and countless bridges, Vermonters were isolated. We did everything we knew how, uh, after General Duby and I flew over Vermont, to get help to help us rebuild as quickly as we could. Uh, we called in not only Vermont National Guard, who did an extraordinary job, but we called upon the governors to send in their guards. We brought in guard members from seven different states. The result was we rebuilt our roads and bridges faster than I think anyone would have anticipated, and the guard was absolutely central to that work. Federal Highways has had a long-term policy where they do not reimburse uh, poor guard work when under direction of the agency of transportation during storms like I mean. We appealed their rejection of our $4 million worth of uh, reimbursable work that the Guard gave us from across the country, particularly great work with the Vermont National Guard. And uh, they have now granted for the first time, historically in storms like this, uh, because of our appeal, uh, to reimburse us fully with $4 million, 100% of that $4 million paid for by federal highways, because they recognize National Guard was out there building roads, doing heavy construction, taking the same risks that our agency of transportation and private contractors were. So that's great news for Vermont. It's $4 million that we didn't expect to get. It also sets a precedent for the rest of the country. So I just want to tell you how grateful I am to General Dewey, how grateful I am to Secretary Searles, the extraordinary work we got. I think it's the right decision, and it's great news for Vermont's budget. I think for the recognition the extraordinary sacrifice that the National Guard made during our crisis and makes in every national disaster. So I just want to turn it over to General Dewey to say a few words. And thank you, Governor. Thank you. I think uh, the decision by Federal Highways really validates the collaborative nature of uh, the Department of Transportation and uh, the uh, Vermont Emergency Management and Public Safety and the Governor's Office and the National and really, we were a team. And we were a team responding to Vermonters in need. Uh, you know, we don't stop doing the work because we're worried about, uh, you know, who's going to ultimately pay for this. We just do what the governor asks us to do and what the citizens require. Uh, but I think that this, this decision really uh, makes a statement that we worked as a team and that um, ultimately, deemed that the work we were doing um, was very important for the state and for the citizens. So uh, I look forward to uh, future cooperations. I just hope that we don't have any more cooperations of this nature because I hope we don't have any more emergency I'm with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Governor. Uh, I'd like to uh, just briefly thank uh, our Detrans team who worked on this issue. Uh, when the initial decision came down, uh, the Attorney General's office, and specifically Assistant Attorney General uh, Dan Dutcher, who, who was, uh, framed, whose arguments were framed in such a way that they were effective, and uh, actually we have uh, a summary of those available if anybody wants them. Uh, special thanks to the uh, Federal Highway Administration and the Vermont Administrator, Matthew Hayes, who couldn't be uh, with us today. Uh, Federal Highway was a partner right from day one of this disaster, worked closely with us, uh, and uh, uh, helped us actually to uh, uh, put together the case that was uh, eventually successful uh, in D.C. And I want to make a special point that the initial decision by Federal Highway uh, was not a wrong decision. It actually was based on their historic practice and based on the typical uh, response of National Guard units in these kinds of disasters, which are usually around uh, security and traffic control. Uh, this response, this operation was different, and it was different enough uh, for the folks uh, at Federal Highway in Washington to actually change the guidance uh, to other states on these issues. The two big differences uh, were these. Number one, uh, the National Guard did job specific to the need that was identified. Uh, when we had the debris issue of the National Guard unit from Maine, 
uh, that specialized in debris removal came in. Uh, we uh, uh, had engineering units generally uh, from other states. We had a need for uh, trucks. That's why a state as far away as South Carolina was involved. They sent a unit which uh, specializes in trucking. So that was one element. The other one, also very important, was that we were able to demonstrate to Federal Highway that we, the State of Vermont, the Agency of Transportation, was the managing entity uh, for this operation. And that happened uh, with the professionalism and cooperation of the National Guard, specifically uh, uh, General Doobie, uh, Colonel Rob Gingras, and uh, the staff who were assigned to our incident command centers and were involved in the decision making. And there was never any friction or never any doubt as to where the direction for the whole operation was coming from. And that was very convincing to Federal Highway. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> This was a massive deployment of resources. It uh, came from other DOTs, it came from the private sector, it came from the National Guard, and we went into it without the answers to a lot of these questions about where's the money coming from, but we always had faith that uh, our federal partners would, would be there for us, and in this case, the Federal Highway Administration has done just that. Thank you. Thank you, General Dewey. Thank you, Secretary Searles and Noel Brown for joining me in our gratitude to the extraordinary dedication of our National Guard. This is some good news. Four million dollars worth of good news. And I, I think it's good for other states going forward as they face challenges like I made. So we're celebrating and we'd be happy to answer questions if you have. What does the four million dollars mean in terms of does it then appear in the transportation budget or the general fund budget? <coughs> you know, as you know, we're uh, dedicating as many millions of dollars of resources to the IV recovery as we possibly can. This really does uh, allow us to have some like four million dollars of flexibility to use this four million for other IV <coughs> expenses going forward. So it's just a huge help to us when we're scrambling for dollars. Had it been budgeted and now we've got four million dollars more to spend? We had anticipated that we were going to spend this four million dollars uh, reimbursing the guards and uh, obviously we can now use this four million so yes, it's a, this is good news. So is the key to getting this money uh, documenting sort of that the DTRANS was in charge of the whole effort and that these um, troops were actually doing the repair work? Is that the key? Was it those, are, those are the two main points in our argument, yes. And other states haven't been able to do that? Well, in, in uh, other states, apparently the practice had been uh, to call the National Guard to do those uh, other two functions that I mentioned, either uh, security or traffic. That was not the case here. I think it's worth mentioning specific cases because there, there's so many images in my mind of the days that John Doobie and I spent together after the storm, but I'll never forget going into uh, the Cavendish Canyon uh, shortly after the storm hit. Literally, just extraordinary devastation. What was that, about a 300 foot canyon that had wiped out the entire section of Pave Road? And there was the Vermont National Guard basically the only, working with a few transportation folks, but they were scattered all over the place. You know, huge equipment. <coughs> and uh, we got it done in record time. So, you know, time after time, we can't exercise enough. The National Guard became our, our construction crews, really melted into partnering with our construction crews. And not only with their skill, but with their equipment, commitment, made a huge difference. When was the field filed? Uh, here. Actually, there's a copy of the letter and response also available. Anybody wants them? Uh, February 7th. So the freed up $4 million has to be spent on IMEAN stuff, or do you want to spend it on IMEAN stuff? We want to spend it on IMEAN related expenses, because as you know, we're squeezing to try to find the resources to rebuild, and if we can get a federal reimbursement for $4 million that we didn't anticipate. It allows us to make other investments that will help us rebuild them up better than the way I mean found us. We're not determined to make that happen. There's no end to the transportation demands on our budget in terms of high energy, other related investments. So it would be useful for transportation? <coughs> Let's not. 
most likely, but we're not going to commit on that yet. And frankly, it goes into a pool of money that wasn't that we wish we had more of to help us respond to it. So it's a huge break. It's four million dollars that we thought we would have. In fact, you know, as I mentioned, uh, because of the good work of the Attorney General's Office of Transportation, this is pressing setting for the rest of the country. So it's good news for future disaster relief and the involvement of the National Guard who are absolutely critical to this in our work. So this hasn't happened before anywhere else in the country? Not that we've been able to find. Very well said. That's all I understand. Come on. This is a gentleman who is here. I'm wondering before he runs. I want to talk about those F-35s and the noise study that came out. What is that? What, what are you saying to people who, thousands of people that, you know, who are affected by the, the jet takeoff noise uh, and what, what is likely to happen if they have to recover? You know? the, uh, the, the environmental impact statement is now on the internet and it's been uh, downloaded uh, widely. Uh, we have a public meeting on the 14th of May in Burlington, and then we'll have uh, two other public meetings out of state in areas that we fly. Um, you know, I, I think we're we're actually um, pretty satisfied that the Air Force did a really good job on the study. The F-35 is is a you know leading technology airplane, and, and it's it's just starting to fly um, in other parts country, mostly in, in the test phase, and consequently there isn't a lot of real data on the noise, so a lot of it's computer modeling, and they've used a lot of the noise that's come out of uh, these early flying airplanes that, that they uh, helped build the model for Vermont. So you know, we uh, look forward to uh, talking to the public about this on the 14th of May, hearing concerns from the public. Um, noise is always a concern, even in our F-16 fleet, we, we do what we call noise abatement procedures, whether taking off or landing, to try to mitigate any adverse um, noise on the community. And we will continue to aggressively look at other ways to mitigate the impact on the community. And I think the first part of that will be listening to the community on the 14th of May. We're talking about 14th and where are <coughs> I think it's at the it's South Burlington, and I'm not sure of the time, but I think it's uh, it's in the evening South Burlington High School, I think. Uh, but it's I just don't remember if it's the high school or the middle school. Do we know um, the, the, the headlines? Yeah, they're louder. How much louder? Well, uh, I mean that's what this um, this study tried to to quantify actual how how much louder. And if you look at the, the modeling that has been done, um, you know, the, you know we, we don't know how much louder except for the data that's been extrapolated from some of these other airplanes. And it looks like uh, in some regimes it's a little bit louder. Um, there are uh, noise contour, uh, a map that, will, that is available that, that, that kind of shows historically our current fleet of airplanes and, and how it may change because of the, the new engine on this new F-35. Uh, I mean, but I, it, it's difficult for me to say how much louder. I can't give you a percentage or a decimal amount, but, but in some regimes, the airplane is louder. Does the receptiveness of the community, you know, and their concerns about noise factor into whether or not You know, uh, let me put this in perspective. You know, this is the, the airplane that the Air Force has pinned the future on. The Air Force, uh, you know, their, their uh, projection is they want to buy 1,763 of these airplanes. They've only designated or announced four preferred bases in the world. And Burlington is very uh, pleased that we are one of those preferred locations. I mean, worldwide, for the U.S. Air Force to designate Vermont as the bed down site for the new airplanes, we, we see it as a real uh, testament and validation of how
how good we are as a unit and how good the state is in, you know, in, in serving the country. Um, I can't answer, you know, the public process <coughs> is a well-established environmental impact uh, way to, to uh, listen to the public, to educate the public, and, and to take feedback. You know, I, I can't say, you know, what the Air Force can't say how much the public hearings impact the eventual uh, assignment of the airplane or not, but, but I know that the Air Force listens and, and we listen. I mean, most of us live in, I mean, most, most of the people in the Air National Guard live in the Jenny County area. It's just a fact. So, so this is our own community. These are our own neighbors. And, and so we take being good neighbors as, as a very important part of what we do in the National Guard. And the new airplane is part Governor, do you have any concerns about the same F-35? You know, I just want to reemphasize what General Dini just said. I think it's a real testament to the quality of the Guard and the quality of General Dini's leadership that we're one of the four locations in the world that has been uh, designated uh, as a possible candidate for this new planes. And that's a real testament to our leadership. I think the process that General Duty and the communities are involved with are absolutely appropriate. Get the facts out, listen to people, and make a decision. But I want to have the strongest, uh, most competitive guard that we can, and uh, I'm proud of the place that Vermont is. So at this point, I'm proud of our guard. But you know, it's going to be an inclusive conversation, General Duty just said. Not only is the Air Force listening, but we all listen. I believe that if we do everything we can to mitigate the sound, if we do with our current plans right now, uh, that we can be one of the four locations that's blessed to be chosen for this technology. Um, shortly after entry to the office here, Father Sue against the state. Your Department of Public Service went for ways and means and urged them to pass the Build Act law, um, authorizing or setting the statute on what's going to to build energy for the legal costs the state incurred. Why wasn't that interfering in an open judicial matter? First, let's uh, remember what we're talking about. We're talking about, a, in this case, a utility merger between the state's two biggest utilities, that there's growing consensus in my judgment is first of all, a savings to ratepayers, and secondly, a very complex uh, merger that is best regulated by the Department of Public Service. Having said that, I think in almost every energy case that's been discussed in the legislature, the role of the legislature is different in energy than has been in other regulated cases because of the, first of all, the precedent that they couldn't build a plan without a permanent voter legislature. And secondly, Act 160 signed into law by Governor Douglas that required a permanent vote before the Public Service Board could act. We've discussed before whether that was wise or not. Uh, we don't need to go into those territories, but I just think that the relationship vis-a-vis -vis energy on all bills uh, to regulation has been the exception to the rule because of the law that we're why I wish they have actually before the public system for today. So in some instances it is okay to pass legislation that that is what I said. I said that the circumstances are different in respect to when they pass the energy them. It was very clear that state law required the legislature to act before the public service board could. And it's not the case with utility merger. So do you think in some instances it's appropriate for the legislature to pass law? We had a long conversation about that. Two press conferences ago. You asked, At which point you I said whether I, whether I would have voted for that once you I wasn't here. I don't know how I would have voted. All I can say is we can debate until cows come home or until this merger happens. Uh, what happened in energy and whether it made sense or not for the legislature to weigh in. Uh, all I can tell you is that on energy related bills, all of them is different because the law required legislative approval before the legislature could act. And those are just the facts. But the law didn't require us to build back. I continue to believe that there was a precedent for set by the government legislature when I was not in public service, and can't blame me for this one, that required
required legislative action in the question, all questions related to the continued operation of the plan. So would you be in favor of a new law relating to energy that told the Public Service Board what to do? I mean, anything? Well, I think the judge, <coughs> judge Burke took care of that for us. Do you? Uh, one other issue involving energy um, is the Clean Energy Development Fund, mm -hmm. which is running out of money. Last year, he didn't approve of what the, the House passed mechanism for shoring up that fund. And I think you said at the time you were going to find a solution. What What is your solution? Because the time's running out for the folks who are using that fund. Uh, my tax department was in the, I believe, finance committee this morning if that testimony took place. I know it's going to. Uh, with our recommendation on how the whole question of energy's continued operation should be dealt with uh, in terms of uh, its its obligation to the owners. And you know, I'm a big believer that, uh, first of all, I want to say I was a believer that the plant would stop operating in March of 2012, so that these questions were irrelevant. And now I'm joining other owners and understanding it's going to continue to operate, and we want to make sure that the little legacy goes home. Entergy has a clear expectation and Vermont has a clear expectation of whatever contribution of the tax they'll continue to pay as they have in the past. We don't want to leave the discussion with, with, with unanswered questions. It's not fair to them, it's not fair to the taxpayers. So, so, so it would require Entergy to pay the generation tax and some of that goes into the clean energy fund? So. Well, uh, I think what, are, what the CS recommending, I know what the CS recommending, is a fair generation tax that is uh, in line with what other states charge, and in line with what other generators in Vermont pay at this time. Uh, my recommendation is, and I feel pretty strongly about this, that it makes sense for the legislature to establish a fair tax, since obviously they're going to continue to operate for as long as they're going to continue to operate. And then the appropriations <coughs> committee should decide how to spend those dollars, just as they do with any appropriation. So I'd like to see us separate the tax from the appropriation, as was you mentioned under the MOU. Uh, I'm a big supporter of the Clean Energy Fund. I will advocate strongly the Appropriations Committee that the Clean Energy Fund continues to be funded through the appropriations of the state. On the uh, legislative involvement in litigation, uh, is it fair to say that last year's uh, measure relating to the Bill Back would be different from actually involving the legislature or, or having the legislature direct the tribunal on how to rule? And this is really, is it really more a matter of the, the uh, uh, you know, how, how the players are going to be paid as opposed to how the game is going to be called? You know, I, I, I can't, I mean, I, I feel very strong, first of all, that in the question that we're talking about, the merger of CB and Mount Tower, it's an incredibly complex, but if we believe in the public service board process, which I did, uh, we should let them do their work in terms of energy. I really feel strongly that because the legislature was required by law to be involved with the question of whether they could continue, continue to operate, how they continue to operate, let's not forget the MOUs were negotiated by the legislature and the governor with the company when they wanted to do the upgrade. They had to come to the legislature for dry cast storage. The list goes on and on. Entergy is the exception to the rule because of laws that precedent that the set when the plant was built and continued when the question arose, if the plant continues to operate after its design life in March 2012, will the legislature be involved? And the answer was resounding yes. So it's different than rate cases, mergers, and other business that comes before the board. And frankly, the public service board understood that. That's why they waited for the legislature to act before they took any action with any documents. They're now working on any energy case. Uh, if enough members of the legislature are bound to determine the vote on some sort of amendment uh, involving the utility merger. Uh, uh, we try to stop them? What should we do? You know, I, I think the legislature is having a very healthy discussion right now about the best way to get ratepayers a maximum benefit we can from this merger. And as I've said before, I didn't ask for this merger. I would prefer that CBPS continue to be owned by CBPS of a lot company. We don't have that choice. So they decided to sell. There were two purchasers. I directed my public service department under the permission of Liz Miller, who I believe is the best negotiator that could ever hire in the state of Vermont, to go get the best deal for ratepayers that she could get. She got that deal. 
she got that deal. She beat on the Green Mountain Tower to get $150 million worth of savings, not in seven or eight years, but up front, back to coming to they pay right away. If the Public Service Board can get a better deal, I'm with them all the way. I have confidence in them. We got the best deal we could get. We could negotiate. Now let's have some confidence in the board. The legislature wants to dictate to the board. I think from a policy perspective, that's a huge mistake that we will all attack. I also think it's unnecessary. I trust the board. If you would prefer that CDPS continue to be just going by CDPS, then why is your department uh, telling the public service board to approve the program in the first place? Well, because governors and states don't have that control of whether a company stays uh, held. We don't have to choose in America, in a free capitalist society, what, who owns what companies. Companies make those choices. The board of directors are working for the shareholders. I'm working for the rate payers. So let's just back up. We went to bed almost exactly a year ago, Labor Day. Uh, sorry, Memorial Day weekend. Made clear that CBPS on Friday was going to sell. And Monday, Tuesday morning, we woke up and found out that the, top, that the stockholders had just enriched themselves by about $150 million. They are looking out for the stockholders. I'm looking out for the late payers. We believe we negotiated $150 million savings, lots of other benefits for the late payers. If the board can get an even a better deal, I am supporting the board. But you, you, you're, you're saying you think the public would be better off if CDPS would remain as is. Yes, I, I wish the Ben and Jerry's were still owned by Ben and Jerry's, and I knew they would be honest with you. But your Department of Public Service is supposed to intervene on behalf of the public. That's what they're doing. And advocate for the public's interest. And you think the public interest is in having CDPS remain as is. That's what they're doing. And advocate for the public's interest. And you think the public interest is in having CDPS not merge with Green Mountain Power. I'm just curious why you would then. Because the they made the choice to sell. That what any company in America can do that. We're not Cuba, we're America. And when a company decides to sell, <coughs> the question for the governor and the department is, of the two offers that were made for the companies as they decided to sell, what would be the best deal we can get for ratepayers? Now, I personally believe that this merger will bring savings to ratepayers over what we would have gotten otherwise if they hadn't sold. <coughs> In, in line with Pete's question, um, in a statement that your office released on July 12th of last summer, uh, you said consolidation of our largest utilities promises significant savings for Vermonters and makes good sense for our energy and jobs future. So that seems to indicate that at that time you thought this actually would, this was a good deal. This created savings, created jobs. I still, that, I still but, believe that. But you're also saying that you would have preferred. I'm just saying philosophically, <laughs> if we can add Vermont companies on by Vermont because that's always my first choice, and I suspect the owner's first choice. This particular merger, I believe, will result in real savings for taxpayers that we otherwise would have gotten. And because Vermont per capita has more utilities than almost any other state in the country, so if we're able to consolidate and, frankly, save ratepayers money by paying fewer bureaucrats to run car companies, it's a win for ratepayers. It's a win for jobs because we have lower rates. So just to be clear, do you think that it would be a good thing for Green Mountain Power and CDPS to merge? Yes. And do you think that would be a better a better result than if they remain independent utilities and CDPS remain in Orlando and independent utilities and gas metro remain? Is it that I believe there will be savings in this merger for ratepayers that we would not have gotten. What about the, the job situation, though? I mean, this merger will happen as a result, and, and as a result, there'll be attrition and the loss of about 120 or so jobs. So aren't you concerned about that and the impact on unemployment in the state? Well, if that were the only question, the answer would be yes. But we all know that the rate of power is directly related to job creation. And we're competing with other states for jobs and for cheap power. Competitive power every single time that one of our employers decides to expand and move on somewhere else. So there's no question in our mind that competitive power is going to job creation for Vermont. I believe this is going to get us $150 million worth of savings that we wouldn't have gotten had the merger not happened. And therefore, this is a job creating merger. 
The uh, Senate and the House appear to be at loggerheads on the question of uh, uh, childhood immunizations. Uh, and I'm wondering where, where do you uh, think this ought to come out? Well, I think, uh, I think the House passed a thoughtful bill, and I feel strongly that we do more to educate parents about the benefits of immunization. Uh, we will raise our immunization rates in Vermont, and Vermonters are logical. They listen to logic, they listen to science, and I agree with the House that that's where we should start. I do not believe that in the end the government should dictate to parents what inoculations their kids have to get in order to get them to public education. So I think the House found it the right balance, and I think it will result in higher immunization rates, and we should start there with education, putting more resources into education. To separate the myths that you read about on the internet with the facts that healthcare providers are giving on this. Is that, a, is that a change, though? Because earlier in the session, your health commission was pushing pretty hard for uh, an end to the philosophical exemption. Well, it isn't a change on my part. I've been consistent. Uh, commissioners tried to educate me. You know, we had uh, interesting conversations. I understand why he feels the way he does as a physician. We just see it a little bit differently. And He's, you know, I think if you ask the commissioner, he'd say he'd like to see the bill go further, but he's happy with the progress we're making. My commissioner don't always agree with me on everything, and perhaps more often than not, they're right and I'm wrong. Where do you think the cloud can use the computing issues go? Um, where, do you, where do you want to go? You know, I feel we have a real opportunity to create jobs and grow economic opportunities in Vermont by not only refunding the money that we collected from the cloud, tax bills that we've sent out to businesses across the state, but also in a more point going forward until we see how other states deal with this issue. And I say that because when I go up, as I did a few Friday nights ago, and cut the ribbon on the new extraordinary office space that's revitalizing downtown Winooski at mywebgrocers.com, where you have the three tariff boys that are bringing on, you know, since I went up there, when we came on in my administration, we were encouraging them to go locate down the new skating mills. There was some hesitancy to do that because of parking reasons. We got involved, we helped working with the city in Whiskey to put that package together, get them the credits and other things they needed to <coughs> solve. The result is, when I went in there for that opening, they had hired 50 employees more than they told me that they would be hiring three months earlier. And they're going to take one floor, now they're taking three floors of the building. The growth is exponential. Those are Vermont kids getting out of a good paying job.